Hi, my name is Derry McDonnell. I'm president of Open Victoria. I'm here with John Farquharson, who's also a director of Open Victoria. We're here to t have a year-end interview with Mayor Lisa Helps of Victoria. As you recall, uh, she was elected just over a year ago uh, to office, and when she came in, she had a certain number of priorities that she said were going to be very important to her in her first year, and the public had a few of its own. So uh, let's go in and find out what Mayor Helps uh, thinks she's done or not done on those issues in that time. Let's go right now. Morning. Thanks for meeting, meeting with us on this Sunday morning. Pleasure. Um, so wastewater treatment and resource recovery, it was, your, uh, it was identified as your number one issue mm -hmm. when I think you ran for, uh, for uh, Mayor's office. Uh, so right now there's currently uh, five official option sets uh, for sewage treatment ranging in estimated costs from about 1.13 billion to 1.34 billion involving one to seven sites. Rock Bay plays a, a central role in all of them. Many seem convinced that this whole exercise is designed to just prove a centralized secondary facility is the least expensive and then move the proposed McLaughlin over to Rock Bay. So what do you say to them? Uh, well, that's an interesting perspective. Um, I was not in favor of the last plan um, for a number of reasons, as in the McLaughlin Point plan. Uh, not the least of which is that it was foisted on the public uh, with particularly the proposal for Viewfield. If we look back, I think, you know, McLaughlin Point may or may not have been a good idea, but uh, s popping out of the box and saying, oh, and by the way, we're going to put a biosolids treatment in the middle of your neighbourhood. Uh, we've already bought the land and here's what you're going to get. I think that's what really de uh, derailed the process. Um, in this instance, we've done it very differently from April till now. Um, ask the public what, uh, what site or sites are acceptable to you. Um, I think that there's still significant room for innovation. We heard the technical oversight panel uh, talk about those deep well potential treatment uh, processing plants at, I, at the outfalls, so Clover Point and Macaulay Point. I think there's still huge potential. Um, uh, the seven plant option looks expensive um, and also uh, there's the question of do the municipalities, Colwood and Saanich, want to pay 100% for their own plant? So I think um, I know for sure that it's not orchestrated to drive everything back to a central. Like that's just that's just kind of conspiracy theory. So it's um, open. The process. The process is open, and I what I wish, like I, you know, as as chair of the committee, um, you know, I'm going to go with the majority vote. And as soon as they stuck the cameras in my face last week after the the committee voted to um, want more time, I supported that because that's my job as chair of the committee is to support the will of the committee. At a certain point, we need to move ahead with public consultation. We need to let the technical oversight panel dig deep for innovation. Okay, so back to that um, site that you, that uh, one option that you mentioned, the, uh, the two site tertiary option, the deep well option, mm -hmm. It's not, a fi it's not an official option right now, but it is being reviewed by the technical Absolutely, and, and like I said last week at the meeting, when we went out for uh, transit with the fair uh, survey, we put out three options, and the public didn't really like any of them, the drivers didn't really like any of them, so what came back? Option four, much better option, a blend of the three plus a new idea. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so, for, so there's still room for more, for additional options uh, to come forward. And, um, but how is it going to be possible to analyze and really fully, uh, fully cost and, and get public feedback, which I know is important to you, on just this uh, current two-site option that's uh, under review? And plus there's a two other unofficial options, I guess you'd call them, that are under review by the technical oversight mm -hmm. panel. But how is it possible to uh, cost, analyze and cost all of those options uh, before March 31st which is the deadline for signing a, um, a liquid management waste plan amendment. Mm -hmm. Well, it means everyone's got to work really hard. Um, committee gave their direction to the top to explore um, the, the two uh, deep well processing options. Um, they don't necessarily fall completely outside of the five options. Uh, there's already an outfall. At, so there's already sewage infrastructure at Macaulay. There's already sewage infrastructure at Clover. Uh, it would be amending that infrastructure that's there. So it's not like we're popping out of the, uh, the closet with new options or new sites. Um, those two 
to both have sewage treatment infrastructure. So it's going to take a lot of hard work. It's going to take a lot of um, willingness to, to do the costing and, and get the information uh, to the public. Um, the, the information about those two deep weld options is now in the public realm as of last Friday, I guess December the 4th, when the top report was published. So it's the, um, so in terms of bringing additional sites forward, um, so this is all going to be done by March 31st, and what you just spoke about in terms of the uh, uh, costing and analyzing, getting public feedback? That's the idea, yeah, at this point. I mean, it's a bit challenging now. We've been delayed by a month from last week, um, so we'll have to see how we can get uh, back on track after the holidays. Will the amendment specify sites, costs? and uh, degree of resource recovery as the current amendment does? I think probably it won't be as specific as the current amendment. I think what we'll get from the province is agreement in principle uh, for an amendment, which will hopefully satisfy 3P Canada, and a lot of work can still be done after the fact. That's what we're hoping for. Okay, with the additional work after the, that, would the additional work after the fact um, allow for potentially new sites to come forward as we go down the innovation road? Uh, everything is an option. Um, we need to be really careful though, the whole, the whole uh, piece of public consultation. I mean, let's go back to Viewfield, right? Like the reason the last plan, plan failed is because the CRD popped out of the, you know, out of camera and said, oh, and by the way, here's, here's Viewfield. And you didn't like that. No one liked that. So what we're trying to avoid is repeating that again. So I mean, yes, there are there are possibilities, but you, we 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 don't want a view field 2.0, right? We we can't just pop out with new sites. So all of the, the Oscar plan, like everything, is out there. The t the top is reviewing Oscar's proposal. Everything is being reviewed. But I, I think it would be very detrimental if someone popped out, whether you or others, with you know another view field, because then we're gonna we're gonna break public trust again. No, no, I would not pop forward with, with, yeah. <laughs> with another view field. No, I, I, I'm just encouraged to hear that uh, there is room for additional sites to come forward, not in a surprise manner, not, you know, generated behind the scenes, but as I understand you, there, there is room here for uh, additional sites to come forward, uh, such as under the, the Technical Oversight Panel currently has the authority to bring forward um, high-value sites that they might come across in this search for innovation uh, in the very near future. And if they do, they have the authority to bring them to the sewage committee, and the sewage committee has the authority to then go to the uh, respective uh, municipalities and ask the respective municipalities to put these new sites forward for um, additional analysis. As long as this all can be done by March 31st, and that's where we get into the bit of the challenge. Why is the March 31st such uh, a concern when currently the work plan um, calls for a 2023-2024 completion, which is three to four years past the 2020 federal deadline. Um, because there are municipalities lining up across the country submitting proposals to 3P Canada for innovative projects and the money has been sitting there for us for a long time without uh, definitive claim to it and I think it's important to uh, at least make an effort to keep the federal funding in place. I just want to follow up on one question. One question. Right now the public has in mind 1.1 to 1.3 billion Rock Bay. Uh, when they get this new determination of whether it includes new sites or not and are asked what do you like or what, what are you in favor of, are they going to see uh, the full cost including resource recovery uh, revenue options along with the site selection? That's one of the things we sent the, um, the consultants back to do a bit more work on, to do more detailed life cycle costing. Um, it's very unusual that elected officials go to the public with five different options and say, what do you think? What, what would have been more traditional is we would have picked an option, we would have costed it, and we would have said, here's what we're doing. Right? But that's what happened last time and it didn't work. So it's almost like by opening ourselves up and costing a whole range of options, people say, oh, well, I need more detail. Whereas getting more detail on all five options or six options or seven options, digging down to that level of detail, uh, it's A, it's expensive and B, it takes a long time. So it's, it's a bit of a catch-22. The public asked to be more involved in site selection and technology selection and so we're doing that. There has to be a balance at some point. 
Right. So as long as they know, though, that uh, it's not just a matter of selecting the lowest price, which, given what they know now, mm -hmm. is what would be likely the outcome. Well, and to me, the the whole point, and I, I, I still wish that we, you know, trusted the public a little bit more and gone out to public engagement. Uh, but now we're we're taking some more time to get some more information. For me, one of the things that I've heard loud and clear is people want to know what are the trade-offs between uh, tertiary and secondary treatment, and and that's the, the the most expensive option isn't tertiary. Right, the most expensive option, as far as we know, is seven plants with with tertiary at at the distributed, the smaller sites. But there's also an option for full tertiary treatment at Rock Bay, that didn't exist before. So let's move on to something else then. Um, certainly, uh, back when you were first elected mayor, the public was saying that homelessness was a major issue in in Victoria and the CRD generally and the city's been active on this front for a number of years. Uh, at a recent premiere of a Victoria-based film on homelessness called Us and Them, the film's director spoke later about the issue and quoted a figure of $23,000 per person to provide housing for a homeless person uh, versus twice that much in indirect and direct costs such as policing and emergency services if you keep them on the street or leave them on the street. The question is, how much is the city spending in total, including through third party agencies, uh, on the homelessness issue? Yeah, I, I actually have uh, that data in detail because I asked for it uh, from our Director of Finance, how much have we spent on this issue since 2008, which was when the coalition was, uh, was funded. I can't remember. Um, offhand, uh, 1.4, maybe 1.4 million in 2015, 1.2 in 2014. I can get you the data, I don't have, but I, I asked that question myself. Over a million a year on average then? Yeah. Well, o n only in the last, I would say, three or four years. Okay. It started off somewhere around 500,000-ish in 20, 2008, but I, I, I have that number because I asked our Director of Finance that exact same question. Okay. Is there a budgeted figure for this spending in the five-year financial plan and what percentage of the budget would it represent? Well, our budget is $221 million, so a million dollars is a, f a tiny fraction of the total budget. But it shows in the five-year financial plan? Yeah, but it doesn't show as uh, um, money spent on homelessness. The contributions we make, $250,000 a year to the uh, housing trust fund, the city's housing trust fund, $100,000 a year to the coalition, $100,000 a year to the coalition housing trust fund. And these past few years, uh, when the shelters close on April 1st, um, we've seen people flow out into parks and that was last year $680,000 extra because there's nowhere for people to go. The other question you had is that uh, everybody talks about solving homelessness and uh, uh, I think the figure of 326, 367. 367 units is the target to solve homelessness current in the CRD. It, does it actually solve it? What about future homeless? Mm -hmm. Well, it solves chronic homelessness. Uh, there will always be people who slip through the cracks for whatever reason, but the idea is that when they do, there's a place for them to go sooner rather than later. Um, I'm sure you guys have been following the news, but uh, last week there was a historic vote at the CRD. Um, ben Isaac and I uh, and Jeremy Loveday pitched what people thought was a really wacky idea. Hey, why don't we borrow the money using the borrowing authority uh, for the, through the hospital board, borrow $50 million to build those 367 units. and you know, front page news, everyone's up in arms, how is this possible, what a wacky idea, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, three months later, the CRD board, uh, hospital board voted unanimously to borrow up to $30 million, which would be matched by the province at another $30 million, which hopefully the feds can kick in another $30 million uh, within the existing borrowing authority. So it's, it's a different era now. We've got to get that plan in place and get that money out the door and we can get those units built. So I'm, I'm actually, uh, even though there's a tent city down at the courthouse right now, I'm optimistic but th that by the end of this term we'll have at least those 367 units built and chronic homelessness substantially reduced. Uh, so that the city doesn't have to spend all this money every year. What would this, um, ha what effect would this have on the current camping bylaw? Uh, uh, say uh, transient or, or 
tourist campers. Yeah, well, tourist campers are already illegal. I mean, that's, you know, that's part of the frustration. They're in some uh, travel magazine and some travel websites like, oh, free camping in Victoria's parks. And so, you know, you walk into Beacon Hill Park and see German tourists with their $400 tents or, you know, tourists from elsewhere. And the Germans just, you know, I've actually heard people walking out of the the Beacon Hill Park speaking German, so that's my point of reference. Um, camping in city parks for tourists is not on. There's a beautiful campground, it's out at Goldstream. So how would you enforce that? I mean, I understand that under the current bylaw, uh, as long as shelter or spaces are available, it's illegal to camp in the park during the daytime at least, or even at night. Even at night. Right. Um, so that would be more enforced, I assume. Well, if, you know, ideally, if, uh, if everyone's got a home, they don't need to pitch a tent in a park. Yeah. But we'd enforce it in the same way we are now, which is complaint-driven um, and or the police driving around every morning and waking people up. But that's, that's not a situation that we want to be in for a long time. It's a huge waste of police resources. I'd like to move on to the Johnson Street Bridge. <laughs> if we must. <laughs> we must. So the March 2012 Council-approved budget was $92.8 million. Since then, um, the change order requests from the builders have come in for more money and they've driven the estimated final cost up into the range of $130 million or more. Uh, much of this requested increase is currently under mediation. Uh, what's the city's goal in this mediation process? Uh, the city's goal is to limit the uh, costs to the taxpayers. Do you have a figure in mind limited to, like, the official budget was 92.8. Have you got a figure in mind as to how much to limit it to, like under 100 million? Uh, not specifically. Um, a lot of the, the mediation is basically whose fault is it? Whose fault is the delay? Whose fault is the fabrication problems? Um, and so I guess what we're trying to do is uh, argue that uh, the city is at, at the least amount of fault and then try and allocate uh, the costs elsewhere. Uh, to think the city's going to get off without paying anything is obviously nonsensical, but, um, but we're trying to limit, limit the exposure. Okay, so there's a phrase you might be familiar with in the world of negotiation, and it's called your BATNA, your B-A-T-N-A, and it stands for your best alternative to a, to a negotiated agreement. So what's the city's BATNA, what's the city's plan B in terms of the uh, uh, mediation process? Well, uh, we don't have a plan B until we get through plan A, which is to go to the mediation in good faith and try and resolve this issue. Okay, so you go to the, uh, you go to the city, I'm sorry, you go, yeah, you go to the, your, the other parties involved, you know, and, and you go to the mediation process mm -hmm. in good faith. But is there a certain point at which you say, boy, we're not going to be able to limit this, uh, uh, you know, the, the city's uh, uh, amount um, to a number that we're comfortable with. So we're going to have to leave the mediation process and pursue other avenues. And that's what I would think of as a best alternative. The best alternative to negotiated agreement is when, the, is when you have an alternative to the, um, the process that you're currently involved in. So is there a, is there a cost figure is, or is there a future date or is there some sort of circumstance at which point you say, that's it, we're out of this mediation process and we're going to pursue uh, another option. Well, one of the kind of leadership principles and values that I've adhered, adhered to for a really long time is make decisions based on what is, not what if. So I can't say what's going to happen coming out of the mediation. I can't say what our solicitors are going to come back to us and recommend. Certainly, we want to make sure that we, you know, proceed in the way that's most fiscally responsible. But I, I, the honest answer is I don't know at this point b until we see what the outcome is. Okay. And then we, you know, obviously we want to find the best way forward. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. The, the redevelopment proposal for the former St. Andrews the School on Pandora faced a storm of opposition from the North Park neighborhood. And uh, the public hearing process was pretty difficult. You yourself called it later the most difficult decision I've faced so far. Uh, could you explain why that was so and what evidence did you and others on council uh, cite in support of this project? 
Sure. Uh, well, it was difficult for a number of reasons. The first of which is I think the city did a really poor job in facilitating a conversation between the neighborhood and the developer. Um, I think we could have done a much better job. And for me, it's lesson learned going forward. When there's a substantial development, large scale, uh, you know, big impact. Um, yes, we have our community association land use committee process that every neighborhood goes through. But I think the city needs to take a more proactive role in being a facilitator for large scale developments. And so I think one of the reasons it was uh, hard for me is because I know we could have done a better job as facilitator and we didn't. And that's why we ended up with hundreds of people with yes and no buttons uh, in, the, in the chamber. So that's one reason. The other thing is I hate to see the, the community so polarized. And uh, you know, is some of the things that were said uh, in the chambers, both with the no button, people wearing no buttons and people wearing yes buttons, uh, were hurtful, were mean, uh, were uh, kind of um, not having anything at all to do with the development and having everything to do with um, assuming other people's motivations. So that was hard. The, the, the dialogue at the City Hall uh, was, was difficult. The other thing that made it challenging, quite honestly, is most of the people on the no side are my friends and neighbours, colleagues, urban farmers, people that I, I know quite well. Uh, you know, some, some who I even would call friends to see them uh, showing up with the no buttons and speaking very passionately and very intelligently about why no. So those, those are the things that made it really hard. In terms of rationale for voting in favour of the development, um, there were a number of things that I considered. Uh, the first was looking back to 1996 to the North Park Neighbourhood Plan, which envisioned 10 storeys uh, maximum on Pandora and 6 storeys maximum on Mason Street. So no one uh, was popping out with any new idea. This had been envisioned since the, the mid-1990s. Um, the 2012 Official Community Plan reaffirmed that it wasn't like when we went through the OCP process, people said, wait a minute, too much height, too much density, too much massing on, uh, on that corner. It didn't, it, it didn't spring up as, as, a, as a concern. Um, so, the, you know, I, I do return to our policy documents. The other thing I think the, 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 the for me the most kind of, I don't want to say defensible, but the biggest reason that I voted yes um, is because I believe that mayor and council are here not to make decisions only for today, but to make decisions that are going to benefit uh, residents and businesses for the next 30 years. So my, my vision, my, my decision making point of view takes us 30 years down the road and looking at that development in that context it made sense to me to, to vote yes, as difficult as that was. There was a meeting last Monday in a Fairfield residence also concerned with a similar type of project down there, and they seem to be raising the same general issues that came up in North Park. So is this a message to them as well? Well, I think, um, again, mm -hmm. what we didn't do well last time, we could do better this time uh, to play a more facilitative role um, in that process. But it's, it's very difficult because people are already so entrenched in their positions and don't seem to be willing to, to move. So I don't know what we can do about that. So Mayor, uh, like you, I'm a cyclist. And, uh, but recently I've gotten a lot of complaints from my non-cycling friends. Um, so when the city decides to reduce uh, the capacity of streets for, for cars and increase it for uh, bicycle lanes, what, what sort of analysis is done by the city uh, beforehand, such as, you know, Fort Street, when that was decided to reduce uh, it down by one lane. Um, well, I guess looking at the benefits of mode share. So uh, one example now is uh, Pandora. <coughs> we did we did a that separated bike lane on Pandora and what's happened is car congestion has increased uh, because the bike lane stops at Cook. So no, one's, no one, particularly a vulnerable cyclist, is going to get out of their car uh, and ride their bike if the bike lane stops. Um, the analysis that we've done is looked at every other place in the world that's built separated cycling infrastructure and you see a mode share. You see an increased cycling mode share. You see a decrease in car traffic the world over, whether it's from Copenhagen to Portland. So we've looked at other cities around the world that have uh, increased separated uh, cycling infrastructure, all ages and abilities networks. And um, 
and made decisions accordingly. One thing that's really, really important to point out, we've also looked at cases where it didn't work, and one of them is Vancouver. And the problem with Vancouver is that they've put in all these separ separated uh, cycling paths, but the, there's no minimum grid. There's no connectivity. There's not, that there's not complete connectivity. So think about it, you know, if your, your house doesn't have electricity coming to it, you're not going to have heat. You're not going to have, you know, electricity. And that's, that's the principle um, that we need to adhere to in Victoria. It's called minimum grid, so that the, there's actual connectivity. And if we don't do that, your car driving friends are going to be really pissed off because it's actually not going to decrease congestion. It will increase congestion. But if we connect um, the grid and the, the goal is that by the end of these eight networks being built 75% uh, of houses in the city will with, will be within 400 meters of the complete all ages and abilities network So then the assumption is that uh, if you do it that way with the principles of connectivity and fully separated uh, lanes that uh, then people who have the capacity to do so will take advantage will get out of their cars and take advantage of the uh, the safe connected uh, bicycle routes and actually might even uh, reduce make more room for cars because there'll be fewer well yeah there'll be fewer cars on the uh, restricted um, you know uh, Road, road surface. That's what's that's what's that's the evidence world over. Again, we're we're really it's kind of sad. We're not leading the way. We're following. We've looked at infrastructure around the world, and you see you see decreased car traffic with increased cycling mode share. Now, it doesn't mean that people are going to ditch their cars completely. It may be that, for example, parents and kids can can bike to school, um, but then on Saturdays when they're out uh, doing their Christmas shopping or whatever, they're going to drive their cars. So it doesn't. It's not. It's it's not naive. It's not to say that people are going to abandon their cars, and but it is to say that if we can make moving through the city by bicycle easier, particularly for people who are who don't ride already, um, it, we will see again world over. We see if you build the infrastructure, it decreases car congestion. So I say to my non-bicycling friends, stay tuned. This uh, potential uh, increase in traffic congestion is only temporary and once the grid is is complete then you'll see uh, you'll probably see uh, a decrease in car traffic absolutely absolutely I mean you know like the Pandora is just the perfect example and it's it's I'm glad we're doing I'm glad we're moving in the direction of this complete minimum grid because it right now they're there with the work we have done there is an increase in congestion there absolutely is your friends are bang on but again if I'm an eight-year-old I'm not gonna ride down uh, Pandora uh, because then when I get to cook I'm thrown into the traffic okay Mayor Helps thank you so much for your time yeah my pleasure yeah thank you very much for the the opportunity